I know you've got an ear out for the start of the podcast, but before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to remind you to keep an eye out for Daryl Lee's limited edition Christmas treats, because they're in stores now. Like the iconic Christmas nougat pudding, so yummy and a a gorgeous little gift. And some delicious Chrissy-themed twists on your favourite treats, like the Daryl Lee Rockley Road with chewy red and green jelly pieces, green and red crunchy milk chocolate balls, my favourites, and green apple and strawberry flavoured licorice. Watch them disappear. Your Christmas treats table will pop with colour and scrumptiousness. Spread some joy, bring the fun, and enjoy the Christmas tradition that is Daryl Lee. Hurry before they sell out. Daryl Lee makes Christmas better. You're listening to a DM podcast. Welcome to The Five of My Life with me, Nigel Marsh. As an author, ad man and theologian, I've always been interested in people's stories. Not just those with a high profile, but people from all walks of life, regardless of fame. Which is why I created this show. Each guest who takes the Five of My Life challenge chooses a favourite film, book, song, place and possession. They tell me their choices in advance so I can research them, but they don't tell me why they've chosen them. That's the subject of our conversation. It's amazing what you can learn when discussing someone's five choices. I hope you enjoy listening to the show as much as I enjoy making it. Internationally renowned improviser Neil Malarkey is in the Guinness Book of Records as a founding member of the world's longest running comedy group the Comedy Store Players in London's Leicester Square. Alongside multiple film, TV and radio appearances, Neil is also a best-selling author and communication expert. In between performing, he travels extensively to consult to major organisations on collaboration, creativity and leadership. So, Neil, welcome to Five of My Life. Thank you very much indeed. And, Nigel, thank you for flying to London just to interview me. Well, listen, I did, and the show last night was chuffing fantastic i really enjoyed it how do you think it went this was the improv show the comedy store players we do every sunday absolutely i thought it was great it was lovely we had a lovely time we asked the audience for suggestions then we make little sketches scenes songs even and the audience was good they gave good suggestions they got what we were after they smiled i always say to people generally out of 10 or our shows are between seven and a half and 9.9 we never go too low um, we're never perfect, but I would say last night was solid nine and point five. And, and do you ever get idiotic audiences who, who, who like spoil it so you can't? The do your only thing? idiocy uh, that inhibits us is the pre-Christmas crowd sometimes, where somebody has seen the show with their girlfriend, boyfriend, February. Then they brought a bunch of mates in August. Something. Then this would be great for their Christmas party. They bring twenty, thirty people in December. And, of course, those people aren't always invested to watch improv comedy. You've got to say, OK, they haven't got a script. We need to li- listen to them. And there's a few people saying, why are we here? Why aren't we just at the pub talking to each other? And they, the worst kind of heckle is not somebody shouting out, chicken, or whatever. It's just, what, what, what do you want, Dave? Do you want, OK, lager? Phil, do you want, OK, I've, can, I just, can, I, can I just get food to go to the toilet? Um, it's the hubbub. The yeah. hubbub. Uh, so generally, we don't mind the audience giving weird suggestions. We don't mind them shouting stuff out. For example, last night, wasn't it great? We asked, uh, give us a location beginning with G. And somebody said, G spot. That Actually, I, I know, I can tell my listeners, is that woman had eyes on you, mate. Well... I can't speak for that, but, uh, you know, she's, she's human. You know, who can blame <laughs> well, well, I have to say, I'm I, I, uh, very impressed with the gentlemanly, gracious way you dealt with. I was talking to you and she came up and she was all over you like a bad suit. <laughs> and, and, and you were very pleasant to her without leading her on. So. Listeners, I have to say that this has happened, you know, once in 30 years. <laughs> uh, it just happened to be when Nigel was here. I mean, I didn't pay her to do this, but she was, <laughs> she was genuinely a fan who uh, saw the show for the first time last week and sent a message on social media. I said, oh, do come again. And she did. And uh, and she gave that brilliant suggestion. So I hope I was gentlemanly. You were, you were very gentlemanly. Now, in your brilliant book, I just love your book, In the Moment, holy crap, that is, everyone should go out and buy that. You say, I am convinced that story is what underpins all my work. And here at Five My Life, 
that's the essence of Fight My Life. It's about what stories the items can provoke. So uh, we're going to start, mate. And we start with the film, always on Fight My Life. And thank you for choosing the film that you chose, because I've never seen it before. Uh, and it is the 1993 French film, Wild Target. Explain yourself. Well, I thought I want to give rise to stories. It actually is my favourite film. Ah, it stars a man called Jean Rochefort, who was also in The Hairdresser's Husband, a film I loved. So I then looked out for anything else he was in. He's been a bunch of movies. Um, uh, another one is Ridicule. But the story, I suppose, in essence, is several elements to it, is that I grew up in France. My dad is British and applied for a job. And they said, actually, go to Paris, do this for American chemical firm. He's a chemical engineer. And so my first memories of life are of France and living near Paris, near Versailles. And so for three and a half years, I was a French child. I knew nothing of what it was to be an English child other than at home. I spoke English. To, I got two brothers. We spoke brilliant French. My, we just teased my parents for their terrible French accent. I went to French school. And so I spoke French better than I could speak speak English perhaps and certainly in France they don't teach you to read until older you're older so by when I came back to UK I was five and a half I was really cross with my parents for taking me away from my home right I didn't understand I, I remember them saying got a letter my brother's five years older he got a place at a grammar school and I thought oh, we're going because of him that's not fair why are you taking me away from my best friend Thierry who lived across the road my school that walnut tree in our garden that I adored so much and haven't yet visited again but one day I will Nigel maybe somebody will be listening to this podcast say hey Neil write a book about all the things in your life so every French movie I, I love you know there was a period when that was in 1993 I was thinking I was a bit fed up with being a performer an actor going for commercials I didn't like the script or a product I didn't like I had to go because that's what actors do auditioning for a play or a TV I think this script is terrible I don't want to do this <laughs> um, but that's what actors do they act and I was also doing comedy and I got to the age I say well I wasn't quite the new kid on the block and I certainly wasn't old and established and I thought what I want to do and I and so I had a wonderful woman in my life at that stage and she encouraged me to go and see movies so and and so I the things I loved at that stage were watching French movies and American independent movies and I thought I'd love to be a director and then I applied I got shortlisted for some schemes the BBC and Channel 4 here in the UK you could direct a 10 minute film that you'd written and I got to the shortlist and then one of the guys on on the interview said well, you don't seem like a director to me you seem more like a producer I think what he meant to say was directors are a bit crazy and you know hair everywhere <laughs> and producers are more kind of understanding budgets and stuff so I went on some production courses I went to see lots of movies at the London Film Festival. Wild Target was one, Shawshank Redemption another, before they were released. But Wild Target, so there's the story of France, but Wild Target is a brilliant movie. It's about a hitman, Jean Rochefort, this French guy with such a beautiful sort of deadpan face. And one of his assignments is to kill a beautiful young woman. He can't bring himself to do it. And so he kind of escapes with her. And then the number two hitman in Paris, in France, is assigned to kill her and... Uh, Jean Rochefort. And of course, there are some hilarious scenes where he's confronted by the number two and said, hello, Mr. X, you know, Jean Rochefort, I'm Mr. Y. And Jean Rochefort, who, what, what? And the number two guy is so cheesed off that he doesn't know. I'm the number two guy. Surely you know me. You you may be Robert Redford, but I'm, you know, uh, you, no, that's it. And, and And the mother of Jean Rochefort, the main character, is also an assassin. She's in an old people's home and unfortunately various characters in the old people's home disappear. Um, and it's just funny. It's, it's romantic. It's got the most brilliant music. Um, it says so many funny things about relationships and hierarchy because at one stage... Jean Rochefort is about to kick, shoot somebody. He does so and then realises there's a parrot and there's a boy with no clothes on uh, behind a curtain who is actually Guillaume Depardieu, uh, Gérard Depardieu's son, who says, OK, you can be my apprentice because he's realising he has to move on. He get, immediately gets you in this pension. You get so many weeks holiday, la, 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 la. And teaching him how to be a hitman, that kind of thing. And the girl who he's supposed to kill kind of lives with him and he's trying to get rid of her, but she won't go. And it's a love story. 
Uh, it's kind of dark, macabre humour. It, it, it's. I think it's. I mean, I really enjoyed it. it it's funny and clever and thought provoking. And there's stuff in it. Uh, I love it when he, he's, he's setting up for a hit, and it, and he sets up a tripod to obviously, you know, rest his rifle on so he can shoot someone in, in his head. But it's not for that. It's for his jacket, so he can hang his jacket up. <laughs> so the juxtaposition between a sort of orderly, gentlemanly. Uh, life and murdering people with knives and guns, which makes me want to uh, ask you about the juxtaposition between improv, where you are flying by the seat of your pants, you haven't got a effing clue what's going to happen, yet it's not without structure. Well, actually, I had a long podcast conversation with Kelly Leonard of Second City, right. where improv started in Chicago. And he said, I'm trying to lose the idea of the word improvisation. I say, I agree. I use the word improv because I'm not flying by the seat of my pants. I know the process works. I know I'm with people who will listen to me and work with what I give. And that's improv. So there are structures, protocols. Um, there's a whole mindset and I'm talking a lot these days about the improv mindset. So it's not just, hey, whatever happens, happens. It's kind of, we're heading towards story, as you mentioned. I'm listening to what she's saying. She's listening to what I'm saying. We talk a lot about the idea of an offer. An offer is something somebody gives you, you can do something with. A brilliant definition by a group called On Your Feet, a mixture of improv and business people who take improv to business and um, actually beyond as well. And so this is the whole ethos is how do you and I create something together? The creativity, the collaboration, which only comes with us working together and listening and being open to diversity. I don't know what you're going to say, but I love knowing that I can use it. I know we're going to go on a story, a heading on a journey together. We know nothing other than we will be there together. So um, that's when I talk about general improv. Doing here at the Comedy Store, I've been doing it for a long time. Every show is different. Every show is unique. So you have a bed rock of we've done this before in this place. We trust the process. We trust the Comedy Store because they've organised wonderful things like brilliant mics so the audience can hear and lighting so they can see us, security, bar, drinks, etc. So there's a certain, a certain degree of structure and then we impose our spontaneity on that based on, hey, give us a location, okay, G-spot, give us a household object, give us a film style. So we are navigating the dynamic of confidence in the process while introducing the spontaneity, the uncertainty of what's the audience going to give us. This is one of the secret reasons why I was so uh, thrilled that you agreed to be on Five of My Life, because that is what I am trying to do with Five of My Life. I have read your book, I've read the book that you chose, I've been in, uh, you know, researching you, and I've got a whole bunch of stuff that I want to ask you about, which I have now trained myself that I will ask you about in the pub later on. <laughs> what I'm going to do in this is follow where you go with your choices. And it's an amazing, pro I mean, you're, you're world class at it, I'm just learning it. It's an amazing process to actually let go, absorb uncertainty confidently. You go, do you know what? He might be saying, I chose that book because it reminds me of my butterfly collection. And you think, oh, well, hold on, I thought you are going to talk about Mike Myers or, or Shrek <laughs> or something. And you go, but I'm going to talk about your butterfly collection. So, so, so thank you. I, I'm soaking this up. And I've, I've, your book, I've, I've got all these notes written all over it in dog-eared pages. So uh, I'm, I am just loving this. So your second choice. Your <laughs> thank you. Well, by the way, aren't we all in life dealing a little bit with what we expect, a script, and a little bit of let's be agile and flexible and go with what we didn't expect, but we'd be foolish to overlook. So it's great you've written your list of questions. If you get to them, that's fine. But if you hadn't done them, I think you would have felt a bit uneasy. Yes. We, you'd have yep. waffled. So I always say to people, know when a moment needs to be scripted and know when it needs to be not. And in every moment, almost, those may alternate. Anyway, you asked me a question and yep. I better answer it. Well, before you do, I have to tell you a story where um, I was doing a, I, I get hired to do corporate speeches. I was doing one in America and some bloke before me was the gambling consultant for Casino Royale. Now, there's a niche job. Yeah. Anyway, so the Hollywood people had hired him to make sure that, I don't know, the tables, the, the cards were played correctly or whatever. But he said something in his keynotes, but I, I, I tried to listen to the person before me just to, you know, be polite and maybe learn something. But he said something I've never, ever, ever forgotten. He said, today only has value because tomorrow is uncertain. Oh, isn't that good? That is good. So if I could tell you how your life was going to pan out, it would ruin it. I think so, yeah. Yeah, it would be terrible. You got, I mean, I, I, I like the fact, I embrace the fact, I haven't got a bloody clue. And yet, 
you made a plan to yes. come to London here. That's right. You didn't just say, que sera, sera. Yeah. You said, I'll make a plan, and within the plan, things may change. That's exactly right. And that's what I try and say to people. And uh, I nicked a quote for my book from um, uh, Woodrow Wilson, the American president, the only one president with a PhD in political science. He said, people misunderstand. They think that government is accountable to Newton, not to Darwin. Now, not everyone listening to this has an A-level or high school qualification <laughs> in maths, but Newton is about laws of motion, mechanics, you know. Yeah. Press a lever here, transfer of energy, out comes a sausage there or whatever, or the car goes because of the energy you put into the wheels. Whatever. Uh, Darwin, adapt, agile. Now, the government, and indeed any human organisation, is a bit of a mix of mechanistic, budgets, planning, and quite a lot of other stuff of conversation. Oh, hang on a minute. That's a, that's an interesting idea. Let's try that. Oh, whoops, things didn't work out to plan. We've got to adapt. But you don't go completely, hey, let's see what happens. Let's just turn up naked. We don't need an office. We don't need a yeah. diary. But also you don't say everything must be organised and planned at the last minute. And Eisenhower, another American president, said, planning is vital, but as soon as you hit the enemy, the plan is dead. Doesn't mean you don't plan. So you've planned quite a lot here, Nigel. But it, it's jazz, not line dancing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm liking that. That's yeah. good. Now, now, your book, mate, God, I, I just loved your choices and, and reading and watching them. You, you chose uh, A Hitch in Time. And, and bizarrely, uh, Christopher Hitchens, who I, I love, uh, published a book three years later with the exact same <laughs> title. I, I mean, I'm not sure you should be allowed to do that. A Hitch in Time by your mate, Andy Smart. Uh, tell us about that. Yes, this is where I just... Um, have to pause and breathe because we lost Andy Smart in May of 2023 and he had a heart attack. And so on Sunday we said, good night, see you next Sunday. And we haven't seen him since. And I'm I'm so sad. We miss him. This is the Comedy Store dressing room recording here now. And every Sunday, I know I kind of hope his grinning face would be at the end of the room and it's not. And I did think because I wanted to show off in this podcast like anybody, shall I have a deep, profound book like In Search of Meaning by Viktor Frankl? And then I thought, actually, I want to, because you said, choose things that bring a story. And I had to read the book again when Andy died. And the story of Andy is just wonderful. This guy who wanted to be a comedian and sort of had to persuade his parents and eventually yeah, it didn't do quite the, as well as A level was expected. Got found a course in Liverpool that was ge half geography, half drama. So he sort of had one foot in proper academia. But the, what he really loved was was performing. He did poetry and then working on the street. And the book is called A Hitch in Time because he would hitch everywhere. So he would hitch around Europe. He had a girlfriend in Bristol, so he'd hitch down from Liverpool to Bristol. And I think on the, you know, what a Saturday morning, he would donate some of his sperm. And that would sort of pay for the train journey back or what he might do is treat his girlfriend to that weekend. Or he'd go and see Liverpool Football Club. And on a Saturday morning, he knew after Friday night, there was always, they needed some people for the identity parade. So they get two pounds. So they, he and his mates would hang out and that two pounds would get them into Liverpool. He also was part of the Western Australia Roof Drinking Association. And they would do things like drink on the roofs of buildings like the Leaning Tower of Pisa, on the moving trains. And one time he realised the train was moving towards a tunnel. There wasn't time to jump down. There wasn't time to suddenly jump off. So he just kind of laid, his whole body was prone and he had to put his his head to the side and skin was ripped off <laughs> but he survived so just stories like that and at the most moving part of his funerals where somebody had found a kind of letter to my children and there was just some beautiful things and he suggested some bars in the world hong kong and shanghai and new york and dublin but also things like say yes and then find out how you're going to do it and that seemed to be profoundly wonderful to me. He has the most beautiful list of stories. When he was eight, he got some new wellies for his birthday. And he thought, oh, this is good. And he went and stood in the river, I think. And then, oh, there, the water was coming up. I'll go deeper. Mm, the water's coming into my wellies. And eventually he was drowning. The wellies filled up. He was underwater. And his mum sort of pulled him out. She'd watched Dr. No the night before. So she managed to do mouth to mouth and he survived but she he vomited all over her brand new summer dress and so from that age he thought he was invincible and everything Andy did was beautiful really in terms of giving so much and then for 15 years or so he worked for crisis here in London crisis at Christmas 
the people who are homeless at Christmas. Isn't it awful to be homeless at Christmas? So they, they get somewhere, they might get a warehouse. Most recently, a very generous hospital, a uh, hotel, I should say, grand ho- hotels, let them come in. Mm-hmm. And Andy, nobody else wanted to do night duty, so Andy did night duty. He would often leave here at 10 o'clock at night and go to this uh, hotel or warehouse or school sometimes. And for 15 years, he did that. So I chose his book, Hitch in Time. It's basically a story of hitching 72,000 miles from Liverpool to the south of England and then across Europe and his adventures about how he nearly came a cropper. He ran away. He made friends. What I would say about the book is, yes, it's not as profound as In Search of Meaning, and yet maybe it is. We're from similar eras and similar background so i was reading that going yeah yeah know that know that know that motorway service station know that he ran with the ball 60 times that, yeah that, that that's not a small thing yeah. i mean i mean that's not right i ran with them once or twice 60 this is in pamplona where we literally run away from bulls yeah and so he was a maybe an adrenaline junkie and and, and was it just just completely out of the blue I don't think he was sickly at all i mean no. it's just maybe at the age of eight he did do a show called the danger show right which he recounted some of these adventures so for example there's a cheese rolling thing yes oh good that's <laughs> just, uh, people kind of fall really terribly down a hill as a massive yeah. cheese is chasing them and there's a football game as well where there's a massive football <gasps> yes, played I'm... with set hundreds of people across two villages and a river yeah and if you score a goal in the 10 hours <laughs> it's, it's yeah. a, I mean, he loves that kind of communal experience but the danger show was wonderful because in two respects he ended it by putting some t- toilet paper long dangling toilet paper up, up his bottom, got a member of the audience to set fire to it. He had a pint of beer. He wasn't able to, <laughs> to put the fire out until he'd drink the pint of beer. And he did. And occasionally he might singe some of his bottom hair. <laughs> and the other one, the most moving was he said, I've been through all these dangerous things and hither and thither. Uh, the most scary thing I had was watching my partner give birth to my daughter because <laughs> he couldn't make it better. Yeah. And that's the one that, that moment where Andy felt truly fearful and powerless. Generally, uh, he'd do things like the Cresta Run. He'd find out, oh, there's a dangerous thing. Let me do that. Wow. What, what, what a life and what, what, what a, yeah, what a book. And I'm yeah, so sorry to hear. The, the, the hitchhiking thing, um, without wanting to be clunky, there is so many parallels with uh, improv. That is, uh, you go, you know, I'm going to stick my thumb out and... and, and <laughs> You know, the bloke might be a right-wing lorry driver or left-wing, you know, tandem bicyclist. I I know I want to go west, but I don't know who I'm going to go with or how far I'm going to get. Well, again, Andy had plans. He realised where it was good to uh, pick up because he realised from previous experience. One time, for example, he was having a drink in a pub in Liverpool. For some reason, he decided, I know, I'll bet you £10 I can get to Ben Nevis climate and come back within, I don't know, was it 24 hours? Yeah, it was 48 hours. 48 so. hours. Yeah. I'm just mad. Now, I I'm I do improv on the stage. It's fairly safe. There are guide rails. Yeah. Yes, Andy would have a plan, but he was open to the possibilities of the open road and where it might lead him. I love it. Sort of life taking you in strange places. Uh, are you in Shrek? <laughs> no, no. I thought you were in Shrek. That was me handing you the talking stick to say, yes. Are you in Austin Powers? Well, uh, <laughs> I'm in Austin Powers. Well, this is where we can obviously talk about Mike Myers. Um, oh, yeah. well, why not? So just, I don't know why you thought I was in... Which part do you think I was in Shrek? Was it my uh, voice or was yeah, I... Yeah, yeah, I thought, I thought you, you were the donkey or something. Or was, it, <laughs> what, what, what was that Eddie, Eddie well, Murphy? Well, thank you very much. Uh, Eddie Murphy is one of my comedy heroes. But I'm not in Shrek. So Mike Myers... As a hired hand there, you know, they said to him, could you do the voice? And he did do the voice. And I believe there's another one coming. Uh, I met Mike, and I may be jumping ahead now. Mike, in 1985, before most of your listeners were born, perhaps, Nigel. And he was, he'd heard of the group I'd been in, the Cambridge Footlights, that people Monty Python had been in, and Sasha Baron Cohen, Olivia Coleman, Stephen Fry, Hugh Laurie, Emma Thompson. 
I wanted to be in the Footlights. I got to be president of Footlights, but then we did a tour around Australia, one of my favourite countries. Can you believe? I think we, I know a lot of your listeners are in Australia, but we toured, we did, we did Adelaide, we did Tasmania, we went to Burnie, Launceston, Hobart, we did Canberra, Sydney, Wollongong, Mittagong, Rockhampton, Gladstone and Darwin. Good on you. Absolutely. A lot of Australians have not been to all of those places. We didn't go to Perth or Melbourne, sadly. Um, but so we came back and the next year's Footlights, who were graduating, had the name. So we put X Footlights on our poster at the Gate Theatre in Notting Hill, Tiny Pub Theatre. Mike saw it. He'd just moved from Canada, wanted to be where English comedy was because he loves Peter Sellers and Monty Python so much, else of British comedy. He knocked on the door, said, can I help? And they in the theatre said, well, yeah, all right, you paint the set and sell tickets. So I met him. He was selling tickets for us. And I said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm... I want, I want to do comedy. I said, well, uh, what do you do, sketches? No, no, don't do sketches. I said, it's all alternative comedy. So I took him to see alternative comedy. And I'd heard of Second City, which he'd been in, the touring company in Canada, because of the Blues Brothers. I knew about Second City and Saturday Night Live and Second City Chicago. So I was interested. He was amazed. Most people never heard of Second City. Then he told me about improv. Anyway, so I took him to see some comedy. We did a double act called Malarkey and Myers. We did the Edinburgh Festival then. He kind of decided because his father's unwell and he was offered the chance to join the Toronto main company uh, but we kept in touch and that's why I'm in Austin Powers 1 and 3 and I helped him <laughs> Who <are> do you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well your listeners may know if they know the film they might remember at some point Mike oh, Austin has to go and reclaim his stuff because he was cryogenically frozen in the 60s so he has to go to a corner master uh, to reclaim his stuff and so that's me so it was basically Mike had sent me the script after Wayne's World 2 which was uh, not such a big hit as Wayne's World 1 he was wondering what do I do next he wrote a script just kind of just so as a spec script you know uh, let's see what happens it's, it's kind of stuff I want to do he sent it to me I said this is what you should do don't just say this is a calling card. This is the thing you should do. It's kind of a cross between James Bond and Nost and, and carry on, if you like. I said, you must have Elizabeth Hurley. Because I knew her a bit because uh, Hugh Grant played in a cricket team I was in. Yeah. You must have her. She'd come through, uh, you know, four weddings and a funeral, all that kind of moment. And so she did. And then Mike rang me and said, I think we got you apart. A very curious thing, Nigel, which is when you release a movie internationally the international distributors need to know some famous names yes you need to get i don't know whether it's point of 10 or 20 like that. so on the score chart in that period uh late 90s hugh grant would have been five neil malarkey would have been zero <laughs> so they had to get some ones and twos here and yeah. there so rob lowe is in it for example one scene which actually didn't i don't think it, i'm not sure it, it played in america but played in the international version tom what's his name who was in the toilet about number two he was he was in yeah. so that meant they kind of got over the line so they could give a naught par carrot <laughs> so i was literally there for a day uh, and then i'm in austin powers three where it's got a bigger budget i flew there for a few days it actually overran i was there for two weeks yeah because it was a complicated scene in Austin Powers 3. Austin's with Mini-Me and how are we going to escape from here? I know, let's put on the coat. I'll stand on your shoulders. Of course, he's standing on Mini-Me's shoulders, yeah. which is impossible. So he has to have wires to keep him afloat. Uh, so that took quite a long time. And then they had to paint the wires out and uh, make sure it it worked visually. And I was a doctor saying, oi, come here, you need to have a, uh, a medical. And so Mini-Me grabs some apple juice, squirts it out as if it's coming fr out yeah. <laughs> from there. And that's a sample. And then I realised actually Mini-Me is there and I pull a gun on Austin and Mini-Me. So that was, uh, that's my Austin Powers experience. And, and uh, Mike again was kind enough to put me in his uh, Netflix series, The Pentaveret. So do the checks keep rolling in or they just give you a cheese sandwich and a 50? I'm going to be honest with you, the checks do roll in. Yeah. Tiny checks. But it's nice, isn't it? But also checks. Yes. <laughs> checks, which I have to pay £28 to put in the bank. I asked, please could I have... Transfer. A, could I have a transfer? No, not unless you're a member of SAG, Screen Actors yeah. Guild. How much did it cost to join it? Oh, $3,000 at least. I, I, I get um, my first books that was translated and published in lots of different countries. Uh, I got a cheque once from Alaskan Library Revenue. Mm. 
and and I, I was just overwhelmingly thrilled. Mm. I, I mean, you know, it was for twelve dollars or something, and, and I, I didn't cash it. I've, I've, I've got it, you know, in my special important memory drawer. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a shame. Yeah. But I want to ask you: Am I allowed to ask you? Yeah, ask me. Because uh, well, as, as we were sort of getting undressed for this um, naked po- podcast, <laughs> you, <laughs> you said to me, "The comedy store saved my life." Oh, we're, we're going to come on to that oh, okay. because uh, so, so we are wreaking havoc, you, <laughs> you improviser, with my format. So we're going to move on to the third choice okay. on Five My Life, and there is actually. A Spotify playlist of every single song chosen on uh, Five My Life. And although, obviously, I'm biased, it's bloody brilliant because the algorithms would never, ever give it to you. So your song will be different to what the Australian Prime Minister chose, will be different to the bloke in Love Actually chose, and, you know, different to the guy who does the poetry pharmacy. It's, it's just a really brilliant, eclectic, now six-hour-long thing. And, and because of you, we are going to go into the 80s, 1980. We are going to discuss the last single that was released before poor old Ian Curtis died. Don't walk away In silence Don't walk away Atmosphere by Joy Division, what many people uh, consider the very, very best thing they ever did. Uh, tell us your story behind that. Well, in my gap year, so I applied to Cambridge, and in those days you applied after your A-levels, so you had a term before Christmas where you do the exams, and then basically from January to September you're off until you go up to university. So my mum said, oh, you must travel. And we actually had some friends, one of my old colleagues, dad's old colleagues, lived in Australia. I said, I don't want to travel, I want to get gritty, and you know, I want to go and work in London and do something really meaningful. And, oh dear. So she found my mum, Community Service Volunteers, which is like VSO in the UK. It's, I think it's called now Volunteering Matters. So I applied to that and I went for an interview at a really grotty office in King's Cross, which was then a very dodgy part of London. And I said, I want to work in London and do charity work. And they said, you can't go to London. You have to go somewhere not near where you live. So I ended up in Birmingham in Handsworth, which if you know the work of Steel Pulse, they have Handsworth Revolution. And so I ended up in Birmingham and I was driving a lorry because one of my skills, my few skills was can drive. Um, So I was driving the lorry around Birmingham for community transport. So we would often go and pick up furniture from people who didn't want it and then we'd sell it in the shop or give it to people who couldn't afford. Or quite often we'd do emergency removals now, in those days, there was a concept of battered wives. Can you imagine that notion? But we'd now call it domestic abuse. But often we'd have to go to somebody's flat or house and the woman with child in arms or whatever, we'd have to move her out very quickly, immediately, so that the violent partner didn't know where they were. Anyway, the great thing was, though, because my mum wasn't in charge anymore, because I loved music, punk music, and John Peel was my man. So here in London, I listened to Nicky Horn, who had a show called Your Mother Wouldn't Like It, Mummy's Chart on a Monday, and then then punk came along. He played The Damned. He played The Sex Pistols, God Save the Queen. And somehow I got onto John Peel. And I lived to John Peel every night, basically. Uh, Monday to Thursday, I think, was his slot. And then at the Christmas, he'd have his festive 50. And I'd never heard this song, Atmosphere by Joy Division. And my blood ran cold or hot or whatever when I first heard it. I think it was very high in the chart in 1980 or 1979, perhaps. Anyway, living in Birmingham... You had brilliant, you had the Birminghamodian, you had the top rank, you had uh, Romeo and Juliet's, you had the Cedar Club. And so I saw Dex's Midnight Runners, I saw uh, Iron Maiden, I saw Iggy Pop, I saw the Psychedelic Furs, I saw Secret Affair, I saw Stiff Little Fingers. Uh, I saw UB40 when they were, before they were famous at Digbeth Civic Hall. And so I was lucky because my parents gave me pocket money. <laughs> uh, otherwise, we had to live on £7.50 pocket money, £7.50 to buy food. Anyway, I went to see lots of gigs and between you and me, Nigel, I sometimes borrowed the lorry. Right. Sometimes I got the bus back. And then in May, early May 1980, there was a gig at Birmingham University Students' Union. It's a bit, of, it was the wrong side of Birmingham. I have to borrow the lorry, weekday, not sure about that. And it was, but it was Students' Union. Could we get in because we weren't students? Oh, we better not do it. And that was the last performance that Joy Division ever did. I think May 5th or something like that before their American tour, 1980. And I've blamed myself ever since. If I'd been there, perhaps Ian Curtis yeah. would have reconsidered. But um, I have never experienced deep depression. I have 
talk to people who have, and it's a chemical thing. It's beyond, you can't say, oh, well, cheer up, or it's, or it'll be all right, or it's, it's beyond any of our, I, I suppose, narrative understanding as to why we might experience this. But it's a brilliant song. Um, Ian Curtis, extraordinary talent. And I remember, and this is another story, he was performing, Joy Division performing on the telly, BBC Two, Saturday afternoon, the Oxford Road Show or something like that. And I was watching it, I was lapping it up. I was watching a video of the people I'd heard on John Peel. My dad came in and Ian Curtis, if you remember, had a particular way of dancing and even staring. And which was great to me. It looked so cool and so different from these kind of, you know, the showbiz types. It was really punk. And my dad came in and said, that boy's not well. Mm. And I laughed. I told dad, he's just being cool with those eyes and that robotic dancing. And of course, he wasn't well. No. And, and the band members didn't realise that these dark lyrics that one of them even said we didn't always listen to them were, were, were going to a place that perhaps was really painful for Ian Curtis. This song has so much for me. So I almost feel sort of guilty at my my pleasure in listening to the amazing music because it's born from... He was writing about his marriage. Those songs, it, it, it's not a pop confection. It's no. a piece of never-to-be-repeated brilliance that if you could have your time again, you would rather not have the songs and the poor bastard would still be alive. But, yes. but that's not how, a bit like your lovely mate Andy, that's not yes. how it works. I mean, it, it isn't. I, and I've read material by his wife and, and daughter who's written about it. And it's, you know, it's, uh, I just don't know how one can cope is, if one is faced with these demons. Mm. Uh, the movie Control is fantastic. Yeah. The songs technically are simple, but they're so brilliant. You don't have to be a musicologist and a brilliant musician to have that energy, that power that what I loved about punk was there was something about it that reached beyond music ability because it was saying something else. So this that's the perfect link to your fourth choice because you have chosen the Comedy Store in London where we are sitting now. And alternative comedy from the 1980s was... Uh, I mean, again, cliche, but it was the punk of comedy. Uh, tell us why you have chosen where we are sitting. Well, I couldn't not really. It's my comedy home. As I've, I've told you the story about how I met Mike Myers and we started the Comedy Store Players in 1985 with Kit Hollaback, who'd worked with Robin Williams in San Francisco and Dave Cohen, uh, who we met, and Paul Merton. They were showing the same venue as us at the Edinburgh Festival, 85. And Kit said, why don't we do some improv? They don't have a show on Sunday. Let's do that. Uh, I was terrified. And so Mike and Kit taught us and we did a show and... People came. It was hard initially. They do the first half will be stand up, and then by January thirtieth, nineteen eighty six, we were doing the whole show, and and we called it Comedy Store Players, Comedy to Go. We felt that was a way of showing this is kind of throwaway comedy. It's not stand up. It's not prepared. And if you've done improv comedy, it's a little bit addictive. And I've been addicted now for thirty eight years. So you are in the Guinness Book of Records. We are in the Guinness Book of Records. We're the longest running comedy group with the same core cast. I mean. With the loss of Andy, you know, yeah. but we still have Lee, Josie, Richard, Ranch, and me. So, so how many, it must be thousands have you done? How many, how many shows? I don't even know. Somebody said you must have done 10,000 hours. I'm, <laughs> I don't yeah. know, 100,000 hours. I don't know. Pretty much done every Sunday since October the 27th, 1985. But, and we, we also do tours. So we're doing a big tour next year of, of theatres outside London, which is exciting. And, and we've played Shakespeare's Globe for 20 years and Regent's Park Open Air Theatre. So we've done a lot of shows. So Mike and I and Paul Merton, Dave Cohen, Kit Hollaback started this very gently. Nobody knew what improv was. They didn't want a show where the audience gives suggestions. There's no script. What are you talking about? And I remember one time we used to go off into an Italian restaurant on the other side of Leicester Square. And the Italian waiter, after a few, said, who are you guys turning up 10 o'clock after... What do you do? And Paul Merton explained, we do a show for two hours where the audience gives suggestions and we create a, a show and scenes and songs and sketches. And the waiter said, no, no, this is impossible. And we said, yeah, you're right, actually. It does seem impossible. But with the audience's goodwill and trusting the process and one another, it can work. So I, this is my comedy home. I've performed here and uh, I'm going to say this. I, gosh, it was just before my 24th birthday. And it'll, I'm still going here now at, at over 60. It's way more than half my life. So the Comedy Store is my home. Don Ward, the man who owns the Comedy Store, was very, very loyal and continues to be so. But that first year, we didn't get many people. But he kept saying, I believe in this. I believe in this. After the first year, he said, well, 
you know, I'm not sure what's going to, let's see how it goes. And gradually, gradually, within a couple of months, we were doing okay. And his investment has paid off. We've been through, you know, tougher times. Often Sunday nights, England are playing the World Cup, <laughs> 1990. Sure. We get small houses. But that, those audiences are quite fun because they don't want to be at the football. They want to be here. So this has been my home. I've met some brilliant people. I get the front row of the show you said last night, how much you enjoyed. I'm the front row of this thing. Mm. I'm even better than the front row. I'm on stage. And we collapse in giggles often. And I say things I didn't know where they came from. People say that was brilliant. I said, really? But it didn't come from me. It came from the ether around me. It came from the space that we occupy together. And we've had just rip-roaring nights. I've met the most amazing people. I've worked with such talented folk, all of the comedy store players, our amazing guests. This is the joy we have. We have guest musicians now who play piano, all just creating songs and atmosphere. So this is my home. And just to mention my work, in my book, which you so kindly have read, uh, there's a chapter on humour. Because I teach people the skills of improv. I teach people presenting, presenting skills and teach improv, which is all about working with uncertainty or collaboration, creativity, a serendipity, working with the unexpected, finding innovation. And then at the end of the day, somebody says, actually, we had such a laugh together, which we don't do normally. And I'm thinking... Okay, that's enough. <laughs> well, well, you know, you're, you're being you're being too modest because in my research, I spoke to three different people who've been through one of your courses. What? At, yeah, and each of them who don't know the other one said it was absolutely sensational for corporate reasons. So they all had a laugh, right, which was great. So they enjoyed the day, but they found it genuinely useful. So if you are listening to this and you run a business, do yourself a favour and give malarkey. What a ridiculous name. Give malarkey a ring. Your possession, which is often my favourite choice, but I'm loving this conversation. Uh, you have chosen uh, your 60 plus London Oyster photo card. And for my international listeners, uh, who, that is the travel card that you have to get on the tube. But you don't need it anymore because yesterday, I, after the show, I just tapped my credit card. And you paid. Yes. With my 60 plus. Oh, it's free, you old it's bastard. It's free. I chose it for multiple reasons. One of which is I'm 60 plus. Right. You don't, look, you don't look a day over 65, thank mate. Thank you very much. And I don't mind. It's okay to get older. I don't want to be 20. My daughter's just done her A-levels. I don't envy her. I'm excited for her going to university now. I had my time. But now I'm 60. I care less about things that don't matter. I, I understand what matters more or less. I'm okay to be old. I'd like to be a bit fitter. Uh, I'd like not to have that back problem occasionally. But I'm old. And I, I think I've got some wisdom. I th the wisdom of perhaps not worrying so much, caring about achievement, and also the broader sense. So I get a free travel after 9am anywhere in London on public transport. Now, isn't that great? So the broader thing is travel. I love travel. Who was it? It might have been George Bernard Shaw or Oscar Wilde saying, if you travel, you understand. But uh, if you travel to other countries or even travel within this possibly divided country even divided city, you see different things, different people, different attitudes. I've, I've been to 25 countries teaching improv and other communication skills. And people say, oh, aren't they different? And no, we're all very similar. Our sense of humour is, because most of my humour comes from in the moment. Somebody says something or has something in their hand and we do, we talk about it. I don't do jokes about British politicians or something. It's all in the moment humour and we all have the same sense of humour. Uh, travel is vital. I met my wife while traveling. She's British, but we didn't meet in, in Britain. But you understand that the world is pretty much the same. Most people are trying to get by. They'll help their neighbor. They want to look after their family. They care about their friends. They want to have a roof over their head. It seems to me that travel is such a, a wonderful privilege, but also a necessity. I think one should get out of one's own postcode. One should look at where things are. Um, actually, since lockdown, I've walked more. Yeah, which is I've been loving. But on the with my zip card, uh, with, with photo card, you probably can get a, a virtual one, but I got a real one because I trust that more. Uh, I don't pay anything to go on the tube after nine a.m. Uh, so I can go see things, do stuff, and I feel okay about being that age. I've brought you the wrong book. I've I've brought you a book in my bag, Fat Forty and Five. <laughs> but but I, my, my recent one is Smart, Stupid, and Sixty. And so we are brothers from another mother because I cannot agree more vigorously is you go oh, life is in chapters and so it should be 
you know, I've brought up four young kids that now have left home and independent adults and that they're starting out and they're going to have a great time. But if you said to me I could take a pill and I would be that drunk bloke in the comedy store watching Jerry Sadowitz, even though it was one of the best nights of my life, I wouldn't want to. I want today. I want to be talking to you. <laughs> I know. And and people will say, you know, what's your favourite thing? And, and the best response is today, now, yes. now this thing. Our story is all of the little episodes that have happened to us. And in my book, I mentioned some research that basically the stories we tell our children, and I dare say that leaders tell their people, will affect how they see the world. So I can say to a, a, a younger person, this is what happened to me. Isn't the world terrible? I can say equally the same facts. This is what happened to me. I got through it. I learned. I overcame. The world's not so bad, actually. You know, Without that, I wouldn't be as tough as I am now. I wouldn't have learned a lesson. I wouldn't have learned how to recover from failure. And so many times in life we fail. And it, as you saw on stage last night, you've been very kind. But there were moments of failure, but they added to yep. the joy of it. I have two more questions for you. Got it. Okay. It's now, we've been going on for 17 hours. <laughs> in your wonderful book, uh, not the one you chose, but the one you wrote, you say, and I'd never heard this before, I think it's William James, that when two people meet, there are always six people present. There are the people that the people think they are. There are the people that other people think the other people are. And there are the people <laughs> who they actually are. That's mind-meltingly brilliant. So it makes me want to ask you, Neil Malarkey, is what, if anything, is the difference between who people think you are and who you actually are? Well, I love that quote myself. And I had to look at myself. And sometimes I've seen people on the stage, in this dressing room, in my family, say things. And I think, what do you mean? How could you think that of me? And I think, maybe you know more than I do. Actually, why is my view of who I am any more valid than yours? But what is reality? Is it what I perceive or what you perceive? Uh, perception is reality. Somebody said uh, the meaning of a gesture is in the response, which I often use in my work, which is whatever you think you said, it's what they heard that matters. I love the notion, holding the terror that maybe other people are right. <laughs> you know, I think I'm a lovely bloke who does it. Yeah, we, and other people think you're a bit of a burke who doesn't do Well, maybe they're right. Yeah. And actually, they're right because that's what they felt. Their feeling mattered. Now, the last question is, who would you like to hear on Five My Life next and why? I reckon... Uh, you could have any of the comedy store players. I suggest, I suggest Josie Lawrence. Oh, she was uh, great. I'd love to have Josie. Now, Josie... Would she do it? I don't know. I was gonna, That's why I hesitated for a moment. Josie is not always comfortable talking about herself. I mean, her art, dare I say, speaks for itself. But she's got some wonderful stories about how she, for example, came from a family that didn't understand uh, theatre. Uh, mine was similar as well. Why, showbiz? How do we do that? Why, where does that start? And somebody said, oh, no, no, you can't play to Rada, not with your accent. And that kind of thing. And she got her equity card by, by singing songs in the working, men club, working men's clubs in the West Midlands. You know, going out with, finding the pianist in the club, here's the numbers and let's sing. You know, really not as glamorous as those who went to RADA, although, of course, uh, she is a brilliant actress. So she might, I don't know, uh, we could ask her. Wonderful suggestion. And Neil Malarkey, thank you for welcoming me into your home and telling us your stories on Five of My Life. Thank you so much for having me, Nigel. And of course, I want to know more about you. I'll, I'll go and read your book. And also, I must, the 61. Yes, yeah. need that. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you follow Five of My Life, you might enjoy my latest book, Smart, Stupid and 60. In it, I write about a number of the issues discussed on the show. It's the 20-year follow-on from my first book, Fat, Forty and Fired. If you have any feedback on the book or suggestions for the show, please get in touch via my website, nigelmarsh.com.